Hello and welcome back. So today I want to continue talking about buck converters and in particular look at what makes the buck converter inefficient. So where are the losses coming from? And of course to handle these losses I want to look at the buck converters big brother, the synchronous buck converter. So if you're curious about what that is and how it works then keep watching. So let's start things off by looking at a practical circuit. So what I got here is a circuit that I've been talking about last time. So this is the buck converter with high side and channel built with a discrete driver. So the free transistor driver. Let's have a look at its schematic for a moment. So I built a circuit here in the simulator and basically we can see the buck converter part. So the power stage since it's an AND channel, we have this bootstrap capacitor assembly and I'm using the basic free transistor driver that I've talked about in the last episode. The only difference being that the very first transistor is a very high frequency transistor so that the switching characteristics are much better. Now there's one thing to mention about this circuit and that is this stabilized voltage that I'm using to drive the bootstrap capacitor and this is important because in real life you don't want the voltage that drives your gate to vary. So to vary with the input supply voltage. This way the voltage that drives the transistor gate will always be of a fixed value, roughly independent of the supply voltage. Now this is good to have the transistor always switching in the same manner, but it's also important in case you're working with high input voltages because the transistor normally has a limited maximum gate source voltage. And this way you ensure that you will never affect the transistor. So if we run this circuit, I got it laid out here and to measure its efficiency, I also added all of these multimeters. So what I'm measuring is input voltage and input current and then output voltage and output current. So the current is being drawn by the active load there in the background. Now, if we calculate these values, we can work out that the converter is working at roughly 87, 88% of efficiency, which is not that bad for a buck converter, especially one built like this with this sort of driver. But that still begs the question, we're dissipating almost half a watt of energy somewhere. So where is it going to? Well, to find that out, we can look at which of the components becomes the hottest because that's where most of the power will be dissipated. And we can do that using the infrared camera. So if we look at the board, we can see that there's one particular component which is hotter than everything else. And it's this little thing in the middle, which is at roughly 35 degrees, whereas everything else is below 29. So one of the components is more than six degrees hotter than everything else. And that component of course is the diode. So it's that little thing there in the middle. So why is the diode heating up so much? Well, let's go back to the simulation to try to figure this out. So if we run the circuit, we can see that we get a slightly higher output voltage. But if we look at the power dissipated, so we look at the diode and the transistor, since these are the two main power dissipators in the circuit, we see that the transistor has roughly 30 something milliwatts, so it's running pretty well, but the diode is dissipating 160 milliwatts. So for some reason, the diode has almost six times more power dissipation than the transistor. And to figure this out, we can look at exactly how the two components are dissipating heat and when they are dissipating heat. So if we look at the current through the transistor, we can see that when the transistor is on, that's when it's conducting most of the current. But at the same time, if we look at the voltage drop on it, the voltage is very, very small. This voltage basically depends on the on resistance of the transistor and the current going through it. So the lower this resistance is for the transistor, the less power will be dissipated on it. Now, another moment in which the transistor will be dissipating a lot of power will be during the switching times. So right now I'm plotting the input signal into the gate and the power dissipated on it. 
and we see these huge spikes when the transistor is going from on to off, so during its transitions. And the better you drive the transistor, so the steeper the slopes are, the less power will be dissipating during these moments. Now on the other hand, if we look at the diode now, we see that this is conducting when the transistor is not conducting, so this is how the buck converter works. But if we look at the voltage during these periods, we can see that there is a bit of voltage. So even though the diode is of Schottky type, the more current will be passing through it, the larger the voltage drop will be. So at high currents we can see 0 0.8, 0 0.9, even 1 volt dropping on the diode. And that means that we will have quite a lot of power dissipated on it. And this is basically the problem with the buck converter. The power dissipated on the diode is equal to the forward voltage times roughly half the output current. So especially at low output voltages, the power dissipation on the diode becomes quite significant. So the way to improve on the buck converter will be to somehow reduce the power dissipated on the diode. Now we know that when the high side switch is on, the diode is not conducting, and when the high side switch is off, then the diode is conducting. So these are working at different times. So what we can do is replace the diode with another switch. And that leads us to the synchronous buck converter. So a circuit that basically looks like this. So what I changed from the previous circuit is that I added this extra transistor, I removed the diode that was here previously, and I also added this driving circuitry to drive the second transistor. So the low side transistor. Now this would be a good moment to look at the actual board that I'm using for today's experiments. So what I got here is a layout project without values or anything to get in the way. And basically, there are a few things I would like to point out in this design. So first of all, my power stage is completely on the right side and as compact as possible. Now by power stage I mean input capacitors, high side transistor, low side transistor or diode, depending on which is assembled, the inductor and then the output capacitor. So the thing that I tried to do here was to keep the power stage, so the components through which high currents are passing, as compact as possible. So to keep the distances as small as possible in between these components. And the second thing was, I tried to keep the ground as compact as possible. Now even though the ground is the ground and it should be uniform everywhere, if your ground is very long, so it's spread out all over the board, and you're having very high currents passing through it, you will get voltage differences between these points. And that's why in between the input and the output capacitor and the diode, there's a very, very small ground distance. Now everything else, the components needed for the driver and the bootstrap capacitor and everything are all thrown on the other side of the board. So here we are talking about low current, so it's not very critical to keep these things as compact as it was with the power stage. And then on the far left side I have my connectors that go to the signal generator which is on the other side of the table. So that has even smaller currents, so even less care needs to be taken. And basically this is the board that we're working on today. So just to see how it works, let's look at it in real life. So before turning it on, let's just look at the driving signals. Basically I'm using a dual signal generator, which is outputting two signals which are in phase opposition. So right now they're 50% duty cycle, so half the time one of them is on, half the time the other one. But even if you had a different kind of duty cycle, the same principle should be applied. The two signals should not be on at the same time. Now, if we run this thing, so we turn on the input supply, we see that the circuit is working quite well. So if we take the measured values again, so the input voltage and current, output voltage and current, and we crunch the numbers a bit, we can see that the circuit is working much better. So we're now up to 91% of efficiency, better than the previous 87, and our waste heat has gone down by more than 100 milliwatts. And the reason why this is working so well is because we reduced the losses that were on the diode previously. Now, there is one thing that I wanted to show you, but Apparently the circuit is not really letting me. 
And that is what happens when your two signals have absolutely no delay in between them. So right now you can see that from the signal generator, just as one of the signals turns off, the other one turns on. And normally this will cause problems, but in this case it doesn't. So if we look at these signals in the gates of the transistor, so in the high and the low side switch, we see that a delay has appeared in between them. So between when one of the signal turns off and the other one turns on, there's a bit of a time delay. And this is very important. This is what is called dead time. And this is important in a converter to prevent the two transistors from switching on at the same time. So if you're driving a proper driver, so you're driving your transistors with a proper intermediate driver, not something built out of a few components, then it will probably not include this built-in dead time. You will have to put this into the signal generator. Because if you don't put this, bad things will happen. So what I did now, we're seeing the input signals. We got this period in which both of the signals are off. And that means that both of the transistors are on because of the way the driver circuit works. And now, as you can see, my power supply is in limitation. The values are all wrong, so it's no longer working properly. And this is because there is a bit of time period in which both the transistors are on. So right now we're looking at the gates and basically during this time the two transistors are short circuiting the power supply, so the input power supply. So there's no way this is good for efficiency. So that's why it's important to include the dead time in between the two signals. So to make sure that the two transistors always have a period in which they are both off. Now if we go into the simulation and look at the circuit a bit and we look into the switching node, so when the high side transistor is on the voltage in the switching node is high and when the low side transistor is on the voltage in the switching node is almost equal to zero. Now in between there's this little time period in which the voltage in the switching node goes down to around 0 0.7 volts. Now before when we didn't have the low side switch we had the diode and when the diode was conducting we had around 0 0.4 volts here. So minus 0 0.4. Now when we have the two switches, the current through the inductor never stops. So it always has a value larger than zero. So when none of the transistors is conducting, the current in the inductor has to go somewhere. And based on the value, 700 millivolts, this seems to be a PN type of diode. Now when I build a circuit, I didn't really put a diode in there. So do we have this behavior in real life also, or is it a problem from the simulation? Well, we have the same thing in real life. So we can see that when none of the switches is on, we have this little gap here in which the voltage goes a bit lower. So where is this diode? Well, the component that we added was an N-channel MOSFET. And turns out, we added also a diode. It's in here in between the drain and the source. So when none of the transistors is conducting, this diode is conducting. And being of PN type, so not a Schottky type, the voltage drop on it is quite high. So the last thing that we can do to improve on the efficiency of the synchronous buck converter is to add the diode back. So to simply put back the diode that we had there in the beginning. And the purpose for doing this is so that during this period in which no transistor is conducting, have a short key type of diode conducting, so not to have a PN type of diode. And this should improve efficiency further. Let's just see if that's the case. So now I added the diode, and if we look again at the efficiency of the circuit, we can see that we've gone on by an extra 2.5. So now we're at 93.4%. And these are basically the ways to get your buck converter to a much more efficient design. So to build a synchronous buck converter, but also keep the diode there. And that's about it from my side for today. So hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.